Uh, welcome everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight is, it's, it's part five. T tonight's part five of our study of the Akshayamati Sutra. But what this has be, become is a study of the, the 10 Paramitas. And tonight we're talking about this paramita, the, the paramita of virya, energy, drive, determination, vigor. We're gonna explore the various uh, translations of this term virya. But what I mean to say is, is that even though this is part five of our deep dive exploration of the Akshayamati Sutra Bodhisattva, inexhaustible mind, I don't want anybody popping in and being like, oh, part five, I'm lost. Bye. We're taught, we're just studying the paramitas. We're just studying the paramitas. We're studying all 10 of the paramitas. And that's why I chose this sutra is that these 10 paramitas, you, you know, you read the Vimalakirti Sutra, you read the Sharangama Sutra, you read this sutra, you read that sutra, you're hearing, you're hearing all about these paramitas. But where's the sutra that just talks about these paramitas that everybody's talking about? Th this is it. It's why I wanted to read the sutra. But what has happened is, is that we, be, we have started dedicating a night one Sunday night to each paramita that which I think each paramita definitely deserves its own Dharma door Sunday night. So that's what we're doing. So if you're here for the first time, great. We're talking about Virya drive tonight, an, an essential bodhisattva practice, virtue, observe. Let's dispense with the English. We're talking about the 10 paramitas. And so we did talk about the paramita of generosity or giving. We talked about the paramita of moral discipline, shila. Last week, we talked all about the paramita of kashanti, patience, patient endurance. And so tonight we're talking about virya, but if you weren't here the other nights, it's okay. If you don't know about the Akshayamata Sutra, it's okay. We're just talking about Virya tonight, <laughs> and so, um, but we are we're we're reading, we're reading from a sutra, words of the Buddha, right? Uh, it's a Mahayana sutra, in which a bodhisattva, a, a seeker of enlightenment. Are are you a seeker of enlightenment? I'm a seeker of so we're all seekers of enlightenment, and bodhisattva Akshayamati, kind of representing our best interest here has asked the Buddha, how does a seeker of enlightenment obtain a mind of enlightenment? How do you get enlightened? And the Buddha said, well, observe these 10 virtues, practices, paramitas, excellences, perfections. They used to be called perfections. These are them. And the idea is, is that this regimen constitutes the path of the bodhisattva. These are virtues that the bodhisattva is mindful of. And, and last week, I, I actually went back through and talked about all 10 of these. And what I did last week, just if you want to go check it out, so it's not a it's not a requisite. It's not a requisite for tonight. But if you want to go check it out, I sort of talked about all 10 of these in terms of their opposites, which is an interesting way. The Buddha, is, the Buddha loves doing this. In fact, we're going to see it tonight. But this way of like, oh, what is, the, what is the paramita? What is the excellence? What is the perfection of, of giving? Well, if you want to know what giving or generosity is all about, just flip it. <laughs> Because that's not the bodhisattva move to be all selfish and hoarding and miserly. No, the bodhisattva is generous and giving. So there you go. There. And that's what we did last week. We went through all of these being morally lax, not uh, having no integrity in a way, not doing what you say you're going to do in a way, 
moral discipline, lack of patience, of course, is easy. That's just being like, you know, short tempered, knee jerk reactions type of stuff. So refer to last week if you want to know about all about all 10 and even an interesting way to think about them, which is their opposites. But tonight here, we're going to talk about this interesting idea of virya. This is indeed one of the 10 paramitas. It, it, if we're thinking sequentially, it's the fourth paramita. And, and there is, in fact, if that raised a question in your mind, there is indeed a kind of a sequence to these things in that this practice does begin with that, that generosity. You, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not practicing generosity or giving, you're not going to have a lot of luck with the rest of these. So these are a little sequential in that way. But nonetheless, this idea of virya, virya is a Sanskrit word. I believe it's where the etymological root of the English word virile, strong, energetic, virile, that's where uh, we get the word virile from virya. In many English translations of this paramita of virya, you're gonna see vigor, energy, determination. I kind of like drive that the bodhisattva is driven, a bodhisattva is driven. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get into the the particularities of this paramita, and because of the way this sutra goes, we're gonna be talking about these ten dharmas, these ten uh, practices or observations that the bodhisattva considers foremost. They that's like these are the these are the top ten practices if you're interested in developing your virya again this energy or drive or determination right um and so this this sutra the buddha began with a poem about all 10 of these and then has gone into these specific treatments of these 10 practices um, and as most everybody knows, if you've been coming to the Dharma doors, we, we've been reading from this treasury of Mahayana sutras here, but I've been working on my own translation. So we go back and forth between all of those and we refer to some Sanskrit sources when we have them available. And so tonight we're going to study these 10, uh, uh, you know, language starts to break down, but these 10 dharmas, principles, again, virtues, that the bodhisattva considers foremost in the practice of virya. Um, we're going to just start going through this, this part of the sutra. If, if you're referring to the other sections, this is the, these are these really blunt lists of 10. There's no... Uh, they, they, they just drop them on you. Noble one, noble, noble seeker, a bodhisattva who practices the paramita of virya, vigor, drive, determination, energy. That bodhisattva regards 10 dharmas, 10 things, 10 practices, 10 observations as foremost. Uh, let me, I'll just do these slowly. I won't give you the whole list. Let's not do the whole list. Let's just go one by one. And I think I want to go one by one because this first one alone, we, we might spend all night just on this first one. So the, the, and, and by the way, let me, let me recontextualize all of this again, just in case these are these 10 bodhisattva practices that lead to supreme unsurpassable enlightenment anuttara samyak sambodhi right and of you know if you're a dharma practitioner student of dharma you you kind of know about attachment clinging source of suffering and so yeah giving generosity is this outturning of of that right 
moral laxity, moral discipline, impatience versus patience. These are all qualities, again, that a bodhisattva, a seeker of enlightenment, is, is cultivating, is interested in, is, 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 is um, mindful of, let me use that language. A bodhisattva is mindful of these things, mindful of the human tendency. And in fact, all sentient beings tendency to not, to not be generous, to not be giving. I talked about this, I think last week, or at some, at some point I've talked about this. Buddhism is the Buddha, Dharma, Buddhism, it's, it's very aware of how we're programmed, evolutionarily speaking, biologically speaking, certainly, culturally speaking, absolutely. Buddhism is very aware of how we are conditioned, how, even to a point how we are hardwired, and that we are hardwired to preserve the self. Yeah. Yeah, it it got it got it got you this far. And <laughs> indeed. But the idea is and this is this is the dharma. This is the revelation. This is the realization that the the organism the this this organism it's in overdrive. It's in hyper overdrive evolutionarily speaking, like if you're into evolutionary biology and you believe in certain sort of tendencies or I, things that might be about self-preservation, indeed. But at a certain point, we, we were, we were well-preserved. <laughs> we were safe. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the organism, it, it was like, no, must keep preserving, must keep preserving, must keep preserving, must keep preserving. Well, meanwhile, you didn't need to keep going. You, you could have stopped. And so the realization is, is that yes, the evolutionary biology or habits conditioning, yes, they got you this far, but they're no longer serving you in that way. And so the idea is, is that it's sort of a, um, well, to, to use some modern lingo, it's a life hack. It's a life hack to start being generous, it might seem contradictory. It might seem contrary to your program, but I guarantee you, <laughs> I guarantee you that it's the move. It's totally the move. As is moral discipline. You, you might be convinced that if you can outswindle the, your neighbor, if you can lie in the right way, or be a whatever, the strong guy, and I can just beat you into, if you go through all that, yes, I know evolutionarily, biologically, yeah, it works to just kind of be whatever, but it's a life hack to then bring it in, <laughs> bring it <laughs> and control your behavior, control what you say, control what you think, right? You know, all of these things, it's like, again, this is going against that. And so tonight, and so I, I went through that and I, I always get into this trap where I'm about to go through all 10. But the idea, the idea is, is that these are all conducive to enlightenment, a, a higher state of being that it might be seemingly contradictory to your conditioning, programming, or evolutionary biology. And tonight is a particular one that's interesting because it's the idea of, that the bodhisattva, the seeker of enlightenment, practices, observes, drive, or determination. Again, energy, vigor. That, those are all the ideas that we're playing with tonight. The Sanskrit is virya. The, the Chinese is an interesting idea of like, um, uh, it's where the term, where is it? Zeal, somewhere in here is, is the word zeal. Oh, there it is, the word zeal. In English, the word zealous, we don't like zealous people in English. 
So zeal is not so alluring. And so we, we, you know, we might shy away from talking about zeal or zealotry in those things, because we're not actually talking, of course, about ideological, uh, an ideologically driven type of zeal. What we're talking about, and this is just before we even get into these 10, drive, again, that some English uh, translators, they choose energy because it's actually about a, a, an, a, a, a um, it's actually about getting up and like getting out of bed and like doing something. That's actually what we're talking about, sort of drive versus and I don't want to preempt I don't want to get too into the specifics but I just want you to know we're talking about the opposite of this is laziness apathy kind of giving in you know this is the thing this is the thing about being a human being we get up each morning and there's there's the drive there's the drive oh. and it would in trust me trust me folks for, for me, sometimes it would be so much easier <laughs> to not get up. <laughs> it would, like there, the pull, you know, Freud called it the Thanatos, the death drive, where the it's like, yeah, let's just go back to sleep. Let's just die. You know, it's just this idea of like, there's a drive, there's a pull that direction. But the human being, the Bodhisattva, there's this other one. And, and this is the thing about it. And, and actually, again, even before I get into these, I, I, wanna, I wanna tell you, I wanna tell, and I said this at some point, but I wanna tell you again. It's this idea about, um, it's this idea, this Buddhist idea, this, this deep dharmic idea that striving, seeking, wanting, all of these ideas of like striving, wanting, seeking, grasping, we as Dharma practitioners, we know that that's causing us suffering. We, 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 we have this um, um, a slight inability to just not be comfortable with where we are with what's going on, right? We always want to want to improve it, get it, you know, we can't just see and in, in a way from a Buddhist sense, be content or equanimous, right? The idea here is, is that the, the Dharma practitioner recognizes that seeking and wanting it to be otherwise is a problem. And so isn't seeking enlightenment or seeking nirvana or whatever, isn't that a problem? Isn't that like, can't, th that be a source of suffering too? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, actually. If you are seeking or wanting to be enlightened, you will never be enlightened, actually. That's the irony of it. <laughs> so what do we, what, but wait, time out then. Wait, how? And the answer is the Bodhisattva doesn't, want or seek enlightenment, they are driven. They are driven to enlightenment. And what I mean by that is that this is a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing, this paramita, this excellence or perfection of, of determination or drive. It's a beautiful thing because it's, it's celebrating and recognizing the energy, the, the spirit, and this idea of, um, and I, I've probably mentioned this in Dharma talks before, but it's this idea that like somebody who, you know, they get up every morning and they are driven or determined or have the energy or vigor to run five miles every morning. They don't, they don't want to be an Olympic athlete. They don't want to be faster than their neighbor. They don't, they don't actually want or seek anything. 
this person, this hypothetical person is just driven to run five miles every day. They, they couldn't, they couldn't just sleep. They don't want to just sleep. They don't want to be lazy in that way. They want to, they want to, they feel better. They feel better after the five mile run. And even though they know this is an important point, by the way, even though they know it's tough to get going, they know about the feeling afterwards, that reward of like, oh, that drive and that determination, it has a payoff in a way. But again, it's not um, a goal. It's not a goal. It's an end unto itself. That is the important thing about this idea of drive or determination. The, the being driven, is it's an end to itself. It's uncontrollable in a sense. And uh, let me just say, I will say one more thing before we get into this very interesting list of 10. The idea here is, again, if you go back to that precarious situation of being a human being, where we have that, that the Thanatos, we have the death drive, but we have Eros. We have Eros, the life drive, the, the, the drive to love and make love. We have got that. And so the idea is, insofar as we're talking about a practice, a practice, you can practice being lazy. And what I mean is, is that those mornings when you get up and you're like, oh, not today. I'll, I'll run, I'll run five miles tomorrow. I'll sit for 20 minutes tomorrow. That laziness, it's like, I'll do it tomorrow. You can actually practice that. And you can actually get very, very good <laughs> at apathy and laziness to the point where it's second nature. Like it's just, it's just like so easy because it's just what you are very good at. And from that point of view of practice, where you have practiced being lazy and you've practiced that very well, being driven, energy, drive, vigor. Oh, oh, I get, I get tired just thinking about it. <laughs> I get, I want, uh, I'll be back over here, right? But the idea is, is that you can practice drive, energy, and vigor, which is that when you feel driven, and it doesn't matter actually at this point in the Dharma talk, it doesn't matter what you are driven to. Let's say you are like, oh, I want to cook a Peking, Peking duck tonight. <laughs> You're like, so like, I want to make a dim sum or I want to like get creative and I'm driven to do it. Not because I want to be a Michelin star chef, not because I want to impress my friends, not because of whatever. I'm actually just going to do it for the doing of it. The idea is, is that if you seize that opportunity where you are driven uh, uh, of your own, it has come and you act on it and, and, and you, you go with that energy and you go with the drive, you are now practicing virya. And the idea is, is that if you keep practicing virya, you keep practicing the drive, the determination, just like somebody can get good at laziness, you can get good at this. And, and, and if you've heard me, you realize I'm not talking about a goal. I'm not talking about like, oh, success. I'm now good at it. This is about developing or cultivating qualities of ourselves in one direction or another. And the Bodhisattva practice, these 10 paramitas are about cultivating some innate, inherent things that are going on. And you can cultivate them like little, you know, the, the, the me operating metaphor, the operating metaphor for this sutra are the roots of virtue cultivating roots like a garden. And if you tend to these things and you, you water them and you fertilize them, they will grow. 
But the, the tricky part about this is, is that if you get those little seeds of laziness, you get those little roots, those little sprouts of laziness, and you water those, they will grow as well. They will continue to grow until pretty soon you're, again, you, you, be, you have become very good at apathy. <laughs> You've become very good at laziness, right? Okay. That's my quick introduction Dharma talk to Virya. Any questions, ideas, comments, ideas? Anybody? Michael? No? Yeah, no. Um, I don't know if I'm making too much of this, but it struck me as you were talking that the construct in English for being driven is the, is the passive voice. And mm. it, you know, you used other um, uh, synonyms that weren't the passive voice, but I wonder if there's something about drive that is, it's sort of like a harnessing an energy that's there versus, this goes a little uh, against what you were saying, but there is a way in which when you know, there, there, there is an impetus already there and we just go with it toward the thing versus ignoring it or, or sort of squelching it as, as you're developing either a habit of being driven, <laughs> of being driven yeah. versus being lazy. Um, I think it, uh, I think, Noam, I think that's a really interesting insight, linguistically speaking about the passive voice of being driven. And I actually think there's something there to investigate um, in a kind of investigating dharmas kind of a way. But what your comment makes me think of is it's a certain aspect of dharma, a certain aspect of Buddhism. I, 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 I almost want to say that it's kind of like something you have to kind of take on faith, but I don't really mean it that way. But what I'm getting at is there is an idea, of course, like, for example, let me say about giving. There's an idea in Buddhism that all 10 of these actually, but I'll start with the giving. There's an idea that actually it is a sort of more innate natural state of the being to be all 10 of these, but it is actually the self ego problem clinging to self that we stop doing these things but there totally would be our natural state if we would stop being so clingy to a self or we would stop doing x y or z that's why the language in buddhism is like avoid doing x y and z so i think there there is this idea in buddhism that so, and certainly, actually, if we move to the exalted state of nirvana or enlightenment, there is an idea in, in, in Buddhism that that is actually a natural state, that we are keeping ourselves from for a variety of reasons, a number of which we're going to get into tonight. But the idea is, is that, and this is important, it's important for a number of reasons, but the idea is, is that enlightenment or nirvana is in no way anything that needs to be worked on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't need to be like, it's not anything you don't already possess or have in that way. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a skill that you need to develop. It's actually some habits that you need to stop <laughs> is, is the, the way of thinking about it. So your idea, just that passive voice of the being driven is an interesting one for that, of a, a more natural state that is, is almost released. Mm -hmm. and, and right then, actually, it makes me think and wonder about how, remember at the beginning of tonight's talk, I mentioned that these are, are rather sequential. So it makes me think about how, as you move through these three, are we releasing the energy and the drive of virya by being more generous, morally disciplined, and certainly 
exercising patience in that way. So just some ideas that Noam's insight brought up. Okay, so the reason actually why I, I went through this long introduction about Viria is because of how cool and wonderful and beautiful and important the first of these 10 practices is. So the sutra reads, um, noble one, a bodhisattva who practices the paramita of Virya regards 10 things as foremost. Number one, uh, just reading from the standard translation, it's acting in conformity with sentient beings. That's totally fine. It's just a little unfortunate because the, the actual, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. It's like, a, um, it, it's this word, it's a Chinese character. It's the first character here and it's the first character here. It, it, it has the, the radical, meaning the, the, etym the etymological root of the word of the pictograph is this flowy, this flowy riverness, which is the little thing on the side. My Chinese is terrible, the writing, by the way, but the radical is this flowy river. The, um, and it means in accord with, to be in accord with, right? The, as the French say, deco, 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 de, like of accord, being in accord with, right? And so both number one and number two, are this idea of being in accord with, in con, you know, the other English translation in conformity with. And then actually what the Chinese says is being in accord with what, whatever sentient beings do. And I, I have here, I wrote it as going with the flow. That is my like paraphrase of this idea, going with the flow, being in, in, and again, I want to explore the language a little bit. It's, it, it literally says in Chinese, it's this idea of like whatever sentient beings do, it's what you do. Um, the, the euphemism, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, that very much comes to mind. But, what I'm, what I'm getting at is, is that, all right, I, I got to tell you, I got to tell you off the top because it's, it's going to come up sooner or later. So I might as well tell you now. This, this is, we're in, we're deep, we're in deep Bodhisattvaville, Bodhisattva town, right? And being in deep Bodhisattvaville, Bodhisattva town. What that means is, of course, is that the the whole enterprise, <laughs> the whole pursuit here, is actually for the enlightenment of all sentient beings. This is not an actually about your or my individual enlightenment. And what I mean by that is, is that there is a way, in fact, so this one, number five, right effort, this is the classic eightfold path step to becoming an arhat, enlightened being, is this idea of right effort. And we're going to talk about right effort. I'll talk about right effort in a minute. But the idea is, is that in the old version of Buddhism, the original version of Buddhism, this was all about you, your suffering, overcoming your suffering, your, you. It was, a, as I often say, it was a self-help, it is a self-help program for you. But this whole program is not about you. It's not about me. It's, a, it's sort of this, uh, the Mahayana, the Mahayana, the great vehicle, this idea of 
how do we like all together, how do we do this all together? Right. And so what I'm getting at is that right off the bat, right off the bat, the bodhisattva, right effort, right energy, right determination. All right, let's do this. Right. The bodhisattva is like, yeah, let's do it. What are we doing? And the idea is, is that the bodhisattva acts in accord with what everybody's doing. And this is not, no, no, don't get it twisted. This is not a lemming, a lemming thing. If everybody's jumping off the bridge, the bodhisattva's jumping off the bridge too. This is not about that. This isn't, no, no. What we're talking about is this, it's, you know, it's, this is such an interesting idea. It has so much to do with drishtis, views, opinions, having your view, having your opinion, having your idea versus a sort of more easygoing, flowy, kind of like, all right, what are we doing? Kind of an idea. Also, by the way, what I mean to say is that it's an interesting thing about drive, determination, and then the first thing, the very first thing on this list is, yeah, you should be driven and determined to go with the flow. <laughs> and it's like, wait, so what exactly am I... No, no, just be driven to go with the flow, right? And what I want you to see, and I mentioned this, at, I get so lost, we're at, we're at part five, so I get lost. But at some point I mentioned, I was speaking about how there are these 10 paramitas and there are these 10 practices and what this does is it creates a matrix, a matrika, a matrika of dharma, a 10 by 10, 100 dharma matrika. And what I mentioned was, is that, and it's built into this bodhisattva inexhaustible wisdom, that there's kind of an exponential uh, thing going on here. And what I mean is, is that I mentioned that as we go through these, there's a way, a very beautiful, subtle way in which these 10 going this way, these 10 correspond to these 10. And so this first Dharma, this first practice of, of drive, which is to go with the flow is an expression of giving. It's, it's like drive giving, <laughs> you know, like, did, like a way it's an interest. And this is what I mean by the exponential kind of way that this works, this suture works is that if you get into these 10 working this way from generosity to omniscience, and then they're working this way too, uh, the uh, literally the wheel of Dharma starts to turn this way. And so it's kind of a very interesting, fun way of looking at drive, which is not in this um, overly determined way, where it's like, you know, this overly determined must get enlightened. It's like, no, no, no. Wor work on going with the flow. Right. And there's a lot to this. It's, it's already... <laughs> Uh, 40 minutes in, so I can't, I'm not going to dwell too long on just this one, but I just want you to get the feeling for what they're talking about. It's this interesting idea that, well, of course, for a slightly more Western, uh, English American sense of drive and determination, drive and determination is somehow rather individualistic it's like you're you're headed to the top 
your like your drive and your determination will get you to the top. And this is not, this is not that kind of driver determination where it's going to make you successful. It's a type of driver determination that actually will make the world better and will ultimately make your world better. That's the Dharma here <laughs> is that it, it's a, it's a win-win. <laughs> it's a win-win. <laughs> so everybody cool with this idea of going with the flow? Yeah, doing, acting in accord. And by the way, too, um, because, well, this, yeah, it's not going to come up too much later on. So I just want you to know that there is also this, um, you know, the, the Bodhisattva is working on, on a harmony, working on harmony with their community, with their environment, where, hey, who said that? It was that you? Wow. I, wow. <laughs> Talk about harmony. Talk about how we're harmonizing with our true nature. Talk about harmony. Sorry, I, I had to take a moment for that one. Dharma joy. Speaking of which, number two. So number two, I think that's where they missed the boat again. Let's see. Yeah, they, I don't, I don't know about this one. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I won't spoil it for you. I'll just read for you what, how I understand the Chinese here. So the Chinese speaks about the, the body, the mouth and the mind and the karma the action of the body, speech, and the mind. And then it says that the bodhisattva working on these things, that their body, speech, and mind action, i.e. karma, should always be in accord. There's that verb again, always in accord with joy. That's what it says. I don't know why if you have the standard English version, they make this thing about always rejoicing in others' actions, words, and thoughts, but there's nothing in the Chinese to indicate that it has, has anything to do with other people's actions, speech, and thought. It just says body, speech, and mind karma, always producing, moving towards joy. That's what it says. And let me, allow me to elaborate. I've already mentioned it a few times. It came up, it came up, it came up during the sutra. And it came up with this idea of the joyful mind. But in particular, it wasn't just about being joyful. It was not about being joyful necessarily what it was and what it is what this idea is about is about this idea and i i don't have the sanskrit uh be the manobirani manobirani the mind of joy was the idea but it's a very particular idea it's there i mean there's like uh stories about madguyayana about this idea and what it is, it's this idea of a mind that can be joy, like receive joy from its own activities, where the, the joy, the pleasure is not dependent upon external stimuli. Eating something, hearing something, seeing something, smelling something, no, the mind actually is capable of producing its own joy. And that's kind of a superpower. Indeed it is. If we're talking about Madhugayana, that's a superpower. And I mentioned, and now I'm remembering it, whatever night I mentioned this, I mentioned that this is also a sort of um, a magical ability to 
let like let's say you were hungry and you needed to eat someone who has fully developed this sort of mind joy could imagine that they have an apple and then just take a nice juicy bite and actually get um satiated from a mind produced apple and then uh, i will let your mind your mind run wild with the the idea that you don't need to rely on the external world. You can just develop your own joy from your own mental activity in that way. And this is about the, the bodhisattva producing that driver determination for making body, speech, and mind activity all moving towards that state of mind that I just described, a self-joyful mind. And right away, I want you to do the good Dharma thing, which is then f flip it. What is the what is the non bodhisattva move? What's the non bodhisattva activity to seek joy out here? No, no, no. Only until I get this or that will I be happy or joyful. <laughs> so that's the opposite of this. <laughs> this is having your all activities of the mind, the body, and the voice, all moving in accord towards this development of a joyful mind. That's the idea. Very good with that. Cool. All right. The third foremost dharma in practicing virya this one's easy. This is my favorite. Being without indolence. And of course, if you go look up indolence, it's like lack of drive. So it's like, how, how do you practice being driven? Well, don't have indolence. <laughs> don't, don't do the opposite of being driven. Don't be lazy. Because indolence, of course, is kind of a, a fancy G, uh, GRE word for lazy, I think. Right? It's a GRE word. And so the idea is, is like, how, how do you not be lazy? How do you practice not being lazy? Don't be lazy. It's a little tautological. It's a little tautological, meaning circular in argument, but not because of what I just said or what I was talking about, which is like the that we do have the indolence drive. <laughs> we have the lazy drive. We have the lazy uh, tendency. And so this one, number three, saying, yeah, don't give in to that. <laughs> That's what this one is talking about. The bodhisattva considers being without laziness the form of a foremost practice, right? Pretty straightforward. Almost, almost as straightforward as the fourth one, which is actually just progressing with zeal. Be like that idea of like, <laughs> and again, this is sort of what I was alluding to in my introductory remarks, where it's like, well, how do you practice being driven? Well, <laughs> when you were driven, work, yeah, go, like, don't give in, do it, just do it, as they say. That's sort of the idea. Um, there's kind of a lot I could say about this idea. Where are we at? Uh, progressing with zeal. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot I could say about, about that that idea. But I think I'll leave it at that because I've said a lot about, I, I, in fact, I've made this gesture so much. I think I, I, I gotta, <laughs> like, everybody, everybody good with those two though, real quick, not being indolent or lazy and then progressing with zeal. Cool. Okay, now it gets interesting. Number five is right effort. This is, a, I, I mentioned it during my opening remarks, this is one of the Eightfold Path, right effort. And if you're not familiar with the Eightfold Path, right, 
the idea is, is this, this old original teaching of the Buddha, this eightfold path, having the right view, right? Right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood. Uh, I'm missing a few all the way up to right concentration <laughs> and right mindfulness. But these ideas that these are old school Buddhist ideas, part of the original self-help program. And the reason why I'm very, uh, why, you know, by the way, you should know that like the Chinese is unequivocal in that we are talking about right effort, like the classic Buddhist Eightfold Path idea. And what, why I think this is so important is that the Mahayana Bodhisattva path completely and fully includes all the old school Buddhist ideas. It's not that this Mahayana replaces the Shravaka or old school path. It's like in addition to the old school path. So what I mean is, is that if you're, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, right effort, traditionally right effort is defined by a fourfold uh, movement, a fourfold activity. And that fourfold activity has to do with wholesome dharmas and unwholesome dharmas. Good activity, not good activity. Wholesome dharmas, if you have wholesome dharmas, a wholesome dharma, by the way, is something like compassion. Compassion is a wholesome dharma. And so right effort was that if you have a wholesome dharma, you cultivate it. If you find yourself feeling compassionate, cultivate it. If you don't, have wholesome dharmas, you should work on developing wholesome dharmas. Meaning if you, if you find yourself not being compassionate, you should work on being compassionate. Then there's unwholesome dharmas. Uh, anger. Anger is a classic unwholesome dharma, an unwholesome activity, an unwholesome practice. And so if you find yourself being angry, the idea is, is that you try not to allow that to grow. And if you find yourself not having any anger, sweet, work on keeping that not part of your life. That's the fourfold practice of right effort in the original practice. Cultivate a wholesome dharmas that are present. And if you don't have them, work on them. Don't cultivate unwholesome dharmas. And if you don't have them, great, keep them away. <laughs> That's the fourfold right effort. And this is saying that the bodhisattva is not exempt in any way, shape, or form from that very activity. That is right effort. Yes. And in many ways, um, in many ways, the paramita of virya is very related to the practice of right effort. Effort, drive or determination, they're part and parcel of the same sort. They're very, very connected, these ideas of making the right effort. The opposite of effort is laziness. It is sloth and torpor. One of the five hindrances is sloth and torpor. But I wanna make one uh, bodhisattva point. The right effort is exactly the same. Wholesome dharmas, unwholesome dharmas, cultivate, don't cultivate. Got it. But the bodhisattva is not just trying to cultivate wholesome dharmas here. It's all over in the whole world. And so wherever, oh, look, oh, over there, there's some compassion going on. There's some compassionate work going on over there. 
I'm going to, I'm going to make a donation to that, that I'm going to help that I'm going to support that, that effort, even though it's not in inside my own mind, it is in the whole world. And so the Bodhisattva has this much more, um, you know, universal in that sense, but this broad application of the Eightfold Path, where it's not just about the activity that I perceive going on between my ears and behind the eyes. It's about these ideas of like, oh, look, there's some anger going on. Let's work on, on quelling that. Even though it's not my anger, it's somebody else's anger, but I should still be sort of performing right effort in working on getting that person calmed down because it'll make it'll make it all better that is the wisdom that is the, truly the enlightened perspective of the bodhisattva and the mahayana by the way which is this realization of like oh it's better for everybody all way me you everybody if we don't do this just in here, but if we do it inside and out. Okay, everybody good with right effort as it pertains to the Bodhisattva path? Cool. Number six, uh, but what, what do they have by the way, number six over here? Oh yeah, can, can, uh, right mindfulness. Essentially, this is right mindfulness, another step on the eightfold path. Number six, though, it's interesting. The Chinese, you you would have to um, you'd have to know a few things if you read the Chinese, because the Chinese just says observing what is it? Ob uh, observing mindful places observing mindful places <laughs> huh. but what they are referring to is particularly the four foundations of mindfulness but in general they're referring to correct or proper mindfulness as it is practiced within the the buddhist tradition there's a lot of um, ways in which mindfulness, of course, is taught, but the primary way, and I believe it is what cultivating mindfulness in this list, it pertains to, well, let's do it. Let's do the thing where we just flip it. And so the non-bodhisattva move is cultivating mindlessness absolute total mindlessness <laughs> yeah that's what the non bodhisattvas are doing right the bodhisattva is cultivating mindfulness and so if you have not studied uh sati or smrti as it's called mindfulness in buddhism a a quick introduction, a general introduction to mindfulness in Buddhism is it's, it's totally in the word mindfulness versus mindless. And what we're talking about is, and again, there's a lot of ways to understand mindfulness. So I'm just giving you a real quick way to think about it in the context of tonight. Mindlessness is sort of not paying attention to what you're doing, um, sort of being very divided, sort of like, oh, whoops, <laughs> whoops, sorry, wasn't paying attention, wasn't mindful. Oh, did I step on you? Ooh, whoops, whoa, hey. So this real not being present, not being mindful, attentive, that is the basic idea of mindfulness versus non-mindfulness. Non-mindfulness is kind of um, a default mode of the human being, a kind of more um, uh, 
um, you know, and it might have to do with self-preservation in that way of like, ooh, 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 like kind of keeping a watch out all the time. But the idea is, is that the human being is very, very capable of intense uh, degrees of focus. We experience this, all of us experience this throughout the day, ebbing and flowing. Our attention, our focus, our awareness ebbs and flows. Sometimes we are on point, on it, we're focused. It's like we are indistractable, very, very focused. Other times we are very distractible. We are very, you know, it's just kind of comes with the territory of being a human where sometimes we are very distractible and distracted. And other times we find ourselves very focused. And when we get focused, this beautiful thing happens, which is that the, the everything else sort of fades away and you're left in a very peaceful, present state of mind. That's mindfulness. And just like I've been saying about drive and just like I've been saying about all the paramitas, you can cultivate this. And you can cultivate being mindless. You, you could cultivate, I think we call it multitasking, right? You can cultivate giving a percentage of your mind to a million different things. And you can get very good at not being present to any of them and being very efficient. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that. But there's also this gathering together, collecting. These are all images, by the way, that are part of the meditation tradition. Gathering, collecting, bringing together, focusing, concentrating, samada, samadhi. All of these are the same idea, which is that our minds can be split between a lot of different things easily, but they can also be brought together. And that's the difference. Our minds can be split between the past, oh, regret, expectation, hopes and dreams, regret, expectations, hopes and dreams. Wait, what's going on? Expectations, hopes and dreams. It can be totally divided in, in these fanta phantasms and delusions of space and time, <laughs> or it can be focused. <laughs> gathered together. <laughs> and so this is about cultivating that mindfulness. Pretty simple stuff. It, I, I, again, I would add, I would add that little salt bay of bodhisattva-ness and say that the idea here is, is that one gathers one's mind again, not just for one's own self-improvement, but it actually kind of makes you sort of a, a better bodhisattva in the world, <laughs> makes you sort of a, a better in the world in that way. And again, that starts to feed this, this um, feedback loop of win-win. Those around you win because you are more focused. So they respond, they give to you better. And so now, ooh, here you, and so it becomes a feedback loop versus confused distractedness sort of breeds confused distractedness. And it's also contagious in that way. So. Okay, very good. Sweet. Number seven, the Bodhisattva practicing drive or determination, the energy makes as a foremost practice, the cutting off of all the kleshas, greed, anger, and delusion. Those are the big ones. Those are the big afflictions. What's translated as afflictions are kleshas, kleshas, colorings, cloudings of the minds, afflictions of the minds, um, 
defilements of the mind. I'm not a big fan of defilements. It's like, I don't know. Affliction, affliction's kind of interesting as a term. Klesha, of course, is, I'm a sucker for Sanskrit, so kleshas. But of course, the idea is, is that cutting off the afflictions, cutting off anger, cutting off greed, and cutting off delusion, that's pretty much the name of the Buddhist game. That's what it's all about. <laughs> so if you keep in mind that the, the traditional three poisons, the three afflictions, the three kleshas, greed, anger, and delusion. Let me give you a quick uh, uh, insight into the three poisons, greed, anger, and delusion. I've never, I don't think I've ever really said this because it just kind of came to me and thinking about some things I said earlier. I've been remarking about um, uh, like evolutionary biology and these senses of like preserving the self, must preserve the self, right? These three poisons, greed, anger, and delusion, they epitomize that effort to protect the self. And what it is, is so let's take greed. Greed is that idea of hoarding and like, ooh, yeah, as much, it's this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And again, it's the idea of self-preservation in overdrive, where pretty soon I've got so much stuff in my garage because now I feel safe and secure. <laughs> Why would I feel safe and secure? Because I have a stationary bike and all this stuff in my garage, right? But the idea is, is that the greed, it's like, again, it's this thing that we are hardwired to think that if we do that, we will be safer. And it's like, the, the reality is, is bro, we're in the 21st century. It, it's not like that. You're, we're way past that, <laughs> is the idea. And so the greed is a holdover from some, like, I mean, single cell amoeba uh, time. And the idea is, is that we're past that. Anger is also a holdover from earlier times. Get, get away from me. <laughs> Don't touch my stuff. <laughs> get away from my family. Get away from my property. Like the anger is about that preservation. And both of those, by the way, the greed, ooh, 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 the anger, get away from my stuff that I'm hoarding. That is delusional. It's at totally delusional. So that's the third of the poisons is delusion. And what I mean by delusion is, is that it, delusion is thinking your stationary bike in the garage is going to make you safer. That's, that's delusional. <laughs> delusion is thinking that greed and anger are helping you. That's delusion. So there's a way in which these three afflictions are three poisons, uh, uh, kleshas, they really work together. There's a really interesting way in which you can actually see anger and greed as the same movement, but just, I want you to go away. That's what I want. <laughs> That's what I'm greedy for, is for you to go away. <laughs> so there's a way in which Aversion or anger is a form of wanting. It's just kind of a negative form of wanting in that way. And there's, of course, a way to look at greed as a form of anger, which is really interesting. Very, very interesting to flip that one too. And of course, they're all aspects of delusion in that way. And so the, the, the Dharma, the program of Buddhism has always, 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 always since day one been about reflecting on our greed, our anger, and our delusion. And 
ultimately, ultimately cutting them off. Where is it? Yeah, cutting off these, but don't cut them off until you recognize why you should cut them off. Don't do it just to do it. Don't do it because I said, or the Buddha said, or whatever like that. It's not like that. You cut them off when you recognize, oh yeah, that's not serving me. That's, it's actually not serving me to be angry at all. It's actually not serving me to be greedy at all. And it's not serving you at all to be delusional. So that's the, the impetus to cutting it off. And again, the bodhisattva move is that one is interested in doing this for the benefit of everybody, not just so that you get enlightened or you become a Buddha or whatever, but that, it, it, again, it's a win-win if, if this happens. Everybody good with that one? Sweet. Ooh, number eight. <laughs> directly perceiving all dharmas. Yeah, they just dropped that on you. Directly perceiving all dharmas. Um, by the way, of course, let's remember, this is what one is driven towards. This is what the determination is for, but not as a goal, not as a goal, but just like running five miles, you wake up every morning and like, I want to perceive directly all dharmas. <laughs> I, woo, that sounds like fun. So that's the idea. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting language going on here. There's a word, there's a, a Sanskrit word called vikaya. Vichaya, I believe, actually, vichaya. And it means investigation, the investigation of dharmas. This is actually one of the factors of enlightenment. If you refer to the seven factors of enlightenment, the, the bodhyangas, these uh, uh, things that bring about enlightenment, one of them, interestingly enough, again, very old school, classic Buddhist idea, is this investigation of phenomena. Yes, little d dharmas, the investigation of any phenomena. That was one of the original ideas. And in fact, it was one of the, again, one of the factors of enlightenment was investigating phenomena. And this idea and and oh this is so this is coupled it's coupled with the classic buddhist idea of vikaya or vichaya investigating dharmas but then they drop that right that chinese character guan to guan is to perceive if if you know of guanyin the bodhisattva avilokiteshvara whose name in Chinese is Guan Yin. This is the Guan to perceive, to directly perceive. So this is an interesting uh, step on this list because it actually combines that factor of enlightenment, which is investigating dharmas, and then makes it per directly perceiving all dharmas. So the driver determination is not just to investigate, but to actually directly perceive and understand all phenomena. This is, uh, this is a big idea. There's a beautiful way, actually, where the original uh, term vichaya in the in the uh, seven factors of enlightenment. It's usually translated as investigation, the investigation of, indar of dharmas, but you can also translate it and it has a hint of curiosity, being curious. So what, what this idea is about 
is about investigating and being curious about this world that we live in. Being curious in investigating phenomena. And there is a way in which just good old fashioned science, putting things under the microscope, put, you know, investigating what's going on here. How's this working? What's going on? That is a virtue or a quality or a paramita or a factor of enlightenment to be curious about this world, investigate, poke at it a little bit, wonder, and you might be sitting there, if you are, if you're sitting there wondering like, well, but how is this a, like, but wait, what? Like, what's this all about? Let's do the thing where we flip it and we look at its opposite. Its opposite is having absolutely no interest in investigating this world, whatever people tell me, yeah, okay. Oh, you, you know, whatever, Di you know, dinosaurs. Okay, yeah, you know, Adam. Oh, it was Adam, Adam and Eve. It was Adam and Eve in the garden. Okay, whatever. Like it's kind of a form of laziness or apathy, but as it pertains to like knowledge where you're totally not interested and you're totally happy to just believe whatever people tell you. So this is an interesting practice of Buddhism in general, and of course the, the, the Bodhisattva path. They're saying, no, don't take anything. Don't believe anything anybody tells you actually. Be curious, investigate, question everything. It's actually a great quality to do it, to be ever curious. And, and here is the, the, the real important part of vichaya, investigating dharmas, uh, directly perceiving dharmas, all of that, a huge part of it is never, never being like, oh, okay, I, I got it. Got it all figured out. I, I, fi I got the thing. I figured it out. I'm done. And now upon this rock, I shall build the foundation of my theory of everything. It's not actually about ever resting in a way, but ever being curious. That's an even deeper part of this practice. Okay, very good with that one. Sweet. So we have a few more, uh, a few more minutes, just enough time for two more practices. So number nine is this classic idea, which is this idea of enriching or maturing sentient beings. That is one of the aspects of drive or determination. That is one of the qualities that the bodhisattva is interested in developing, which is maturing or enriching sentient beings. I've meant, I mentioned this in other nights. I'll say it again. If you have ever heard the language of bodhisattvas saving all sentient beings, the bodhisattva makes a vow to save all sentient beings. Bodhisattvas do not make a vow to save all sentient beings. Bodhisattvas do make a vow to mature or enrich all sentient beings. And because, so the language of salvation and saving sentient beings, yeah, that's definitely not what we're talking about. <laughs> It's, it's sad, it's sad that that language has even entered into Buddhism. So we're not even going to deal with that. But there's a sort of still a certain situation. The Bodhisattva is like enriching or maturing sentient beings. What's that all about? 
I want to share, I want to like share with you an example of what we're talking about. So in particular, Mahayana Buddhism is beautiful because of this idea of all sentient beings. This is not an anthropocentric tradition. <laughs> it happens to recognize that it's written in a language that is for anthropods, anthropods, human beings. So it recognizes that it is sort of speaking to anthropods, all of that, sure. But it is not really anthropocentric. It is about the cultivating and developing all sentient life, all sentient beings, human, divine, animal, insect, plant, and so what's interesting about this idea of that the bodhisattva is interested in cultivating the drive or the determination or the energy to mature sentient beings. One very, very simple way you can think about this and then just start applying it. The bodhisattva is like, not like, but would be a gardener, meaning that the Bodhisattva looks and sees and says, oh, look, look at that plant. It needs water, gives the water. The non-Bodhisattva steps on the plant mindlessly because it doesn't know where it's going, <laughs> has no regard for the maturing of sentient life is totally myopically involved in their own situation. And so the idea is, is that if it's a plant, the Bodhisattva wants to cultivate it. If it's animal life, the Bodhisattva wants to cultivate it. And most certainly if it's other humans, the Bodhisattva is a teacher, a guide, a musician, a whatever. It's about cultivating, not destroying life, not stepping on life, not stepping over life, asleep on the street or what have you, but cultivating life in a variety of ways. That's the drive. That's the determination. When the Bodhisattva recognizes that they have a little uh, oh, I, I would like to do something to mature, mature or enrich this person's life. I have something to teach them. I have something to share. That's the bodhisattva move, to share, cultivate, to mature. So it's, I, I, I really, I enjoy actually giving Dharma talks on this idea because I think it's such a beautiful thing. And I like giving Dharma talks on it because I also think it's very misunderstood, but because of a language problem of either like salvation, where it's like, I'm really great, I'll save you, or all these weird dynamics of, of um, even the idea of like maturing sentient beings. Oh, because I've got my stuff all figured out and you don't like, it's not, it's again, it's not like that. It's about this compassionate uh, heart that actually wants to see life thrive. That's it, period. Wants to see life thrive. So again, if it's that plant, it's like, oh, that plant could use a little more light. It could use a little more water. It will thrive. It will, it will mature and enrich if, if it has a little more water, a little more light. Again, versus the person or the mind that is not looking, doesn't care. <laughs> that plant can die. It doesn't matter. There's, an, there's the bodhisattva way of being, which is about, oh, no, we're enriching and maturing life. In fact, yeah, in fact, I want to, I'll make one point. Uh, I once had a very good, it was a conversation I had, but it was after a lecture. So I was in a monastery 
And I went to a lecture in which a monk was a Buddhist monk was giving a lecture on Buddhist morals and ethics. Great lecture. So I went to the lecture and afterwards I was talking to the monk and you know, ideas of right and wrong and good and bad, especially within a Mahayana context of duality, it becomes very tricky. And this monk, in such a succinct way, explained all of Buddhist ethics, morality, all of it, and said, Buddhism is about cultivating life and avoiding the destruction of life cultivate life, avoid the destruction of life. That is the, that's the moral compass. Does this promote life or does it promote the destruction of life? If it, if it promotes the destruction of life, we, yeah, we're, we're not in, or I'm not in as, a, as for me, Buddhist, Bodhisattva practice guy, I'm not in, destruction of life promoting life. That's it. It's a very simple barometer, actually. Okay, everybody good? Because the last one's easy. The 10th foremost practice in the development of drive, determination, or energy is seeking Nyana, seeking all knowledge, seeking omniscience. But not as a goal. I already said that at the beginning, not as a goal. It is that idea that just like the person that wants to jog, and it's like they just, they want to jog. <laughs> the Bodhisattva is like all knowledge. <laughs> it's like that's what we're doing but not again not as a goal not as an aspiration but because they just couldn't not seek all knowledge <laughs> and by the way that last one seeking all knowledge it's another beautiful reference to how the matrix is moving this direction as we move this direction because the 10th the 10th practice is concerning this, the final paramita of all knowledge. So. All right, folks, we did it. We did another paramita. Questions, ideas, comments, epiphanies, realizations? I feel like it's maybe a silly question, but it's always sentient beings and not just beings. So does that mean that like in Buddhism that there are non-sentient beings? Like, I mean, like is a rock considered like a being, it's just like not sentient? In, in, indeed, indeed a rock or what have you is considered a non-sentient being. Okay. And the, it's an interesting question, Tanya, it's not silly at all. What the, the emphasis Oh, wow, it's a fascinating question, actually. The emphasis on sentient beings mm -hmm. is that Buddhism is actually very interested in um, uh, sensory organs. And it's actually why in, in some Buddhist traditions, plants don't qualify. In some, some, not all, but in some Buddhist traditions, plants are not considered sentient because they don't have sentient... Uh, sensory organs. Trust me, other Buddhist or, uh, groups definitely think that there are aspects of plant life that are sentient, so they qualify. But the point is, if you know your dharma, which Tanya, I know you do, there is this thing about sensory organ contact the, uh, from the contact of sensory organ with sensory object, there arises vedana or a sensation. And it's from that sensation that craving arises. And it's from craving that clinging and from clinging suffering. So Buddhism actually thinks that like, or I don't want to say that too, too broad, too grand. Some Buddhist uh, types of Buddhism 
they think that basically like rocks and all those things are not suffering because they don't have the sensory organs to create the sensory stimuli to create the confusion of suffering. So it's any, any organism, insect, but whatever, that has sensory organs that can come into contact with sensory objects to create stimuli that they can get them confused. And so even from, again, certain Buddhist points of view, insects are confused, greedy, angry. And even insects can be matured and cultivated in the Dharma. I know it sounds crazy, but that's the idea. <laughs> so good question, Tanya. All right, folks, so that's it. Um, we are gonna keep moving on and we're gonna have a lot of fun discussing meditation next Sunday. So I hope you can tune in. I wanna thank you all for coming and a, uh, a bon, bon rouge d, a, a good red day to you all. <laughs>